Good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are in the world. Hello, my name is Clive Gray, and I'm at Stellenbosch University in Cape Town. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kondwani Jambo, who is a group leader based at the Malawi Liverpool Wellcome Trust Program in Malawi. He holds a Master's of Science degree in Human Immunity and a PhD in Immunology from the University of Liverpool in the UK. Uh, he underwent postdoctoral training at Cornell University and is the previous recipient of a Wellcome Trust Intermediate Fellowship and is the current recipient of the MRC, the UK MRC African Research Leader Award. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce Kondwani, who's going to talk to you today about COVID-19 in Africa, the African story. Thank you, Kondwani. Thank you, uh, Clive, for the, kind, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, so I won't spend much time introducing myself as you've already done. Um, I think we can go straight to the, to the presentation. Uh, so thank you. Uh, today, I want to share with you um, what I'm calling um, a presentation titled The Unusual COVID-19 Pandemic, The African Story. Um, uh, this is really uh, an interesting um, uh, 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 storyline for Africa uh, in comparison to the rest of the world. So we'll start from um, uh, some work, some early predictions, very early on in the pandemic. This was published in July 2020. Um, in this study, um, it was a modeling study. Uh, they are trying to model the outcome, uh, potential outcomes of COVID-19, as well as um, if, the, if we put mitigation strategies, what would they be and what would that be the impact in low and middle income countries? And in this uh, study, um, the, the first uh, figures you see here, F, G, H, and I, the first one was looking at uh, potential uh, cases, which is infection per million. And this is divided into LIC, low income country, LMIC, low middle income country, uh, and then up to, uh, to upper middle income country, and, and, and then, and then um, the high income countries. So the, 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 from these predictions, um, uh, from there, they went on to look at the um, cases requiring hospitalization, those requiring critical care, which is in H, and in I, uh, the mortality, which is death. And what was obvious is when they looked at the, the, the case uh, fatality rates um, from the original in starting point in, in China, uh, they actually had, in the model, it predicted that you would find lots of de more deaths in the high-income countries than in the low-income countries, interestingly. Uh, and that was attributed to age. So this was the age factor. So uh, uh, because uh, in the low-income countries, the age uh, distribution is, uh, is biased towards um, uh, low or younger populations or younger uh, uh, individuals. But um, this... Um, they took it a step further and looked at the resources in these particular countries to see if people came into the hospital requiring, for example, oxygen or other critical care services, how, what would, how would this be impacted in terms of mortality? And what they found is that um, uh, the, the biggest impact um, was actually in the low income countries in the sense that um, uh, even though young, younger, being a younger population seemed to have looked like it was protective. When you then look at the effect of having low resources, it was actually negated. So they actually, from this paper, the conclusion was that even though a younger population might look to be protective against um, uh, uh, the COVID-19, the fact that the health systems lack capacity uh, to actually be negated and actually there'll be uh, like a disaster in, in, in low income countries. And we know that that's, that hasn't happened um, uh, and, and would go through this, the presentation to, to see why that, that is the case. And we also know um, uh, that if you look at the case, um, uh, uh, the, the in hospital mortality from COVID-19 in Africa compared to the rest of the world, you actually find that actually Africa uh, seemed to have had um, uh, a higher in hospital mortality at about 48.2%. Uh, compared to the rest of the rest of the world, about 35, 31.5%. And this is all related to the resources available in the clinical uh, care setting, as predicted by the earlier study in July 2020 in the science article. And uh, what was very clear is that the increased mortality was, like I said, due to insufficient critical care resources, as well as um, uh, uh, high numbers of people with HIV, diabetes, chronic liver disease, and kidney disease. 
So at this point, we are seeing that the, 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 um, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic um, uh, is in terms of in hospital mortality is worse than what you're seeing in the rest of the world. But the numbers um, uh, are we actually lower um, uh, because of several other factors. We did a, we did a study uh, uh, in 2021, but this was from actually looking at the first COVID wave um, uh, in Malawi, which was by the original uh, uh, original variant, the Wuhan variant, or the Wuhan, Wuhan strain. And in this study, what we found is was actually a very interesting phenotype. We we found that in in our setting, uh, people are presenting to hospital late with severe disease. And what happens is when they went to hospital, when they were tested for P uh, using a PCR for uh, SARS-CoV-2, a lot of them actually came out negative. And when they went into the hospital, uh, 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 the clinical management uh, um, guidelines at the time was that if you test positive, then then they'll give you um, some specialized uh, COVID-19 care that included uh, uh, administration of dexamethasone, which actually helped benefited a lot after it was discovered. Um, it discovered, benefited a lot of people after it was discovered. And what uh, we ended up doing is to, to look at the immunological profile of these individuals that had all the symptoms of COVID-19, but that were had PCR negative compared to those that were PCR positive and had COVID-19 symptoms. What was very clear to us in this data that we showed is that actually the, 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 these two groups were actually synonymous with each other uh, in comparison to other uh, uh, groups with um, uh, uh, respiratory infections that we also recruited in the hospitals controls. And um, what the, the key thing from this, the key message was that it was better for people to present to hospital early to avoid this um, uh, misdiagnosis because the other part I didn't talk about is that in the individuals that um, did not get standard uh, COVID-19 care, they actually had high mortality. So this issue of high mortality seemed to have been uh, uh, common across um, uh, Africa. If we then look at the pandemic in general, uh, on these two graphs, the one on your uh, left is actually looking at the number of cases, the one on your right is looking at the number of deaths caused by COVID-19. What's obvious, as you can see, the number, the number of cases, uh, Africa had the lowest number of cases, then Asia, South America, North America, and Europe had the biggest number of cases. This is up to uh, February 2022. If you look at the number of deaths, uh, Africa as well had the least, and South America had the highest. Um, and of course, you can say, okay, this is the issue of undercounting, um, underreporting. Yes, that is true, but to some extent, but it might not completely explain uh, uh, what we're seeing here, that the pandemic here seems to be less severe in the sense that if you just look at the number of deaths and the number of disruptions, for example, in the healthcare system, uh, 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 you can't compare to what we, we saw in this pandemic in Europe, in North America, as well as in South America. If we look at vaccination rates for Africa, um, this is a very sorry, sorry map um, and, and very disturbing in the sense that you can see that Africa is the least vaccinated continent. Um, from this data and for all so many other reasons why this has happened and we we hope that next time the next coming pandemic if we have one um, uh, this needs to be addressed um, uh, going, going forward but the key thing is that it's the least vaccinated continent and uh, up to the date when we look at the contribution of Africa in terms of the COVID pandemic in terms of scientific output um, despite Africa um, uh, uh, having a less severe pandemic, we've contributed significantly, I think, to scientific evidence um, on COVID-19. There was work from South Africa, uh, from Shabir Madis group, from Penny Moore's group, uh, from Wendy Beggars at UCT, uh, uh, and so many other colleagues in, in Zambia, uh, in Kenya, that have done excellent work um, that has informed actually policy, as well as dri driven a lot of the public health response in, in, across the world, not just in Africa. So there's a lot of contribution, uh, scientific contribution that has come uh, uh, from Africa. So to me, I look at this COVID uh, pandemic from two, uh, two uh, angles. So either you can look at this COVID pandemic in Africa as a cup half full, or you can look at this as a cup half empty. In terms of cup half full, we have had low numbers of severe COVID-19 cases. Uh, we have had um, uh, 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 low numbers of reported deaths and have produced strong scientific uh, contribution uh, uh, to the COVID-19 uh, response. On the other side, 
on the case on half uh, empty is that um, uh, the high the high case uh, fatality ratio in the previous waves. Things have changed now with Omicron. Um, at the same time, we, just, we still have low vaccination coverage. And like I said, this needs to be addressed. And um, uh, at the same time, the volume and diversity of scientific contribution is relatively limited on the African continent compared to the rest of the world. I'm actually privileged to be giving this talk. I think it's a very important initiative by the IUIS because it also helps in addressing this uh, issue of, uh, of diversity. So I'll give you a case study of Malawi. I'm based in Malawi. Um, uh, so this is where Malawi is. If you can look at the map of the world, Malawi is a country in Africa, and it's um, uh, uh, that's where it's located, as I've, I've indicated. So Malawi has a population of about 19 million. Uh, it's highly uh, uh, the population is a high. It is regarded as a high population density country. Uh, its median age is about 17.5, and that's critical. You should keep that in mind. The HIV preference is now uh, about 8.1% in people between 15 and 49, which, has, which is the group that has most of the uh, uh, HIV infection. And if you look at HIT coverage, I think Malawi is doing very, very well. Um, I think it's getting now uh, just over 90% of the individuals that are, 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 known to be HIV, are known to be HIV infected uh, on antiviral therapy. So that's, 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 a, that's, that's an important uh, 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 Thing to not. In terms of the uh, the case, the, the pandemic, the epidemic in Malawi, um, this is a Dutch board uh, from the, the Ministry of Health. Uh, this was done on Friday, uh, last Friday, and you can see we only had 19 cases at a time. But in terms of uh, uh, total number uh, uh, of cases, um, uh, Malawi has had uh, 85,000, just about 85,000 cases. And in terms of deaths, we have had about 2.6, um, uh, which is 2,612 um, uh, uh, deaths. With um, uh, vaccination, just uh, under 5% of the, the recommended target that we wanted to vaccinate uh, uh, in Malawi. So given at least 1 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, we have had the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, about 400,000 doses. But just if you look at those that are fully vaccinated, they're about 800,000. So it's not ideal, keeping in mind that the uh, eligible population uh, before the change in policy was about 11 million. Now there's a change in policy that includes people that are under from 12 years above. So that number, of course, uh, meaning will be around 15 million of 15 to maybe 16 million of the eligible population to be vaccinated. So we're very, very far from the, from the vaccination target. If you look at the epidemic waves in Malawi, we have had four waves um, uh, over the period, starting from around uh, April 2020 to now February 2022. And these um, uh, epidemic waves, um, uh, the original variant, um, that's around in the April 2020 time. Then we've had, had the Delta variant around the uh, December 2021 um, time, then Delta around July, June 2021, and then recently we have had the Omicron wave, which is now getting to its end as well. So if you look at um, our genomic surveillance data, so we, we have a, a study that we're doing. We, uh, we recruit individuals in um, uh, our primary health facilities where we test for SARS-CoV-2 on a regular basis. We have been doing this since um, November 2020, uh, um, around 2020 and up to the date, we, we test every single day. Um, every individual, the individuals that are coming into hospital with um, different symptoms, um, including those that could be uh, attributed to COVID-19, and then we screen for SARS-CoV-2. And from those, those that are positive, um, uh, obvious, we sequence the, 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 the samples, and then we're able to assign what is the circulating um, um, variant at a time. So you can clearly see in January 2021, the majority of them were the beta variant. Um, uh, uh, in July 2021, was the Delta variant, and then we have the Omicron, both the B1 and the B2 uh, 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 Omicron. And this is, mirrors uh, what you also see in South Africa. And what happens is uh, in our epidemic, Whenever there are changes in South Africa, a new variant is introduced. We are able to, what we know is that 
two to three weeks later, we'll find it in Malawi. And that's what has happened across all the four waves we've had uh, uh, in Malawi, suggesting that actually uh, an integrated regional approach to tackling a pandemics like this COVID-19 will actually be of substantial benefit that, than in-country or single country responses. So if we look, we have, and, and when we look at the serial surveys, um, looking at the serial prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies in the population, we are fortunate we have um, a very good collaboration with the Malawi Blood Transfusion Service, where we run a study from, uh, uh, no, from January 2020 to now, and it's still ongoing, where we have been doing, um, uh, collecting uh, serum samples that are stored by the Malawi Blood Transfusion Service from blood donors, and then follow them up over a period, uh, like I've indicated. And um, uh, you can clearly see there, I've shown um, the different um, uh, uh, variants that have been circulating, the original variant, the beta variant, the delta variant, um, as well as the Omicron. And what is important is that you can see that the beta variant, after the beta variant hit Malawi, in around the December period of time, there was that's when it had the biggest uh, 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 increase in the serial prevalence in the population. And that time we had um, around 60% uh, uh, of the blood donor uh, uh, serum that we had um, uh, testing positive for antibodies against this. And if you look at the, uh, the time before that, we are only able to start seeing um, any significant antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 after uh, 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 July 2020. 2020 and nothing before that, showing that SARS-CoV-2 had not been circulating widely uh, in the country before that period. And then we've also been see, able to see after each uh, uh, each um, uh, variant introduction, uh, uh, at least a month later, you start seeing an increase in the in the in the uh, uh, serial prevalence. And now we are hitting into numbers that are actually very very surprising numbers, like 80 to 90 percent of the all the blood donor uh, cell survey have been testing to be positive. And we know that this is a, a, a selected population. Um, there is limitations in this uh, study, including we can't really ascertain the behavior of the blood donors. Maybe they put themselves at a higher risk of SARS-CoV-2. Um, that can be one reason. But we know from other work we are doing that this probably uh, uh, overestimates the cell prevalence by about a factor of about, uh, uh, let's say, 10, 10, between 10 to 15 percent. So it still shows us that actually the cell prevalence in the population would be very high. Um, maybe around uh, 70, between 70 and 80 percent. And this is consistent with data published recently from, from uh, Shabia Madis group in South Africa showing uh, this high cell uh, prevalence in these in this African populations. Okay, um, another important uh, piece of work. So this is uh, uh, from that um, high facility surveillance we're doing, which has include genetic surveillance. Um, and this shows us the same kind of uh, waves we see in the national data. Uh, uh, in figure A is looking at the percentage of SARS-CoV-2 PCR positive uh, 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 individuals. And you're gonna clearly see in January 2021, April 2021, July, uh, in January 2021, July 2021, and then June, January 2022, that's where we see the waves. And these are clearly, the first is the beta variant wave, uh, the second is the delta variant wave, and then the fourth, is the Omicron wave, and we're able to uh, 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 to do a logistic regression on this in, in, the, in this data set to see if there are differences in terms of symptoms that are, uh, people present with when they have a Delta infection compared when they had a, an Omicron uh, infection. And what we saw was actually uh, interesting because um, what we found is that most of the symptoms, cough, headache, abdominal pain, fatigue. Uh, uh, were more uh, uh, associated with uh, the Delta or, uh, variant than the Omicron variant. So the odds, for example, fatigue, were about four times more in the Omicron infected individuals compared to the, in the, in the Delta infected individuals compared to the Omicron infected individuals. And you can see that some of the, the, the symptoms, including fever and headache, were more common in the people with, uh, infected with the Omicron. And what you can see from this picture is that actually it reflects very well the epidemiology of these two uh, variants, that the Delta variant was probably more um, uh, uh, severe uh, than the, the, the Omicron, which is relatively mild. And that's also true for our national uh, uh, data, which I'll show. So this is an example. Um, uh, this is actually the actual cases and deaths in Malawi. Uh, uh, 
over the period, um, looking at the whole or on uh, national data, what you notice is that um, when you look at the difference between the Delta and the Omicron wave, you can clearly see from this data that if you look at the number of cases, we had 20 more, 20% 20 more uh, cases at the peak of the uh, uh, Omicron uh, uh, wave compared to the Delta wave. But when you look at the number of deaths, we had 67% less in the Omicron wave compared to the Delta wave. Consistent with the data I just showed you at a, a, a health facility level and at an individual level in terms of symptom, symptoms. So considering what I've talked about to this point, um, are large and targeted COVID vaccination campaigns still necessary in this environment? I know in other countries now we are going for booster doses, now going the fourth booster dose and talking about the fifth booster dose. But in, 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 in places like Malawi, where we don't have lots of vaccines available and we have very high seroprevalence rates, and clearly, for example, we see that the Omicron variant is a bit mild compared to the other variants. Do we still need these untargeted COVID-19 vaccination campaigns? I will leave that to you, to, to, for you to make um, uh, a decision. But I'll give you some data that would in still encourage us to do some bits, uh, continue with vaccination, but maybe not in the same way we are planning to do uh, when we first didn't know much about COVID-19 like two years ago. So this is a study that we've been doing. Uh, so this paper is under review, where we recruited individuals that had um, uh, recovered from mild or moderate uh, laboratory confirmed COVID-19. And then we followed, followed them, we're following them up for, uh, for 12 months. We sample them every month. We take blood sample where we collect uh, 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 serum as well as uh, peripheral blood monoclear cells. So this part of the study, I'm just gonna show you uh, uh, work to do on the serological aspects of the response. So um, like everybody, like most uh, studies have shown elsewhere, uh, we clearly demonstrate waning of this neutralization and pseudo neutralization antibodies, uh, pseudo neutralization titers uh, over time, uh, uh, at least before or at a maximum of six months, you already have lost most of your neutralization capacity in these individuals that had mild or moderate uh, uh, COVID-19. And that's what I'm showing on this, uh, on this graph. We also were fortunate in this study uh, uh, that in some of those individuals we recruited we were following up, they were actually vaccinated, at least with a single dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine um, while in the, being in the study. And uh, they were vaccinated about 60 days uh, median post laboratory confirmed diagnosis. So we have data pre and post vaccination in these individuals. And what we show um, is that if you look at the pre and post vaccination levels, whether of anti-spike antibodies, or if you look at anti uh, receptor binding domain antibodies, you actually find that um, uh, there's a, an increase, a substantial increase in the, in the amount of antibodies soon after, uh, after vaccination. This is a month after vaccination, about 28 days after vaccination with a single dose. And um, uh, these levels actually go beyond uh, a proposed uh, putative level of about 154 um, uh, uh, international units. Um, uh, binding uh, uh, antibody units, uh, which have been proposed to be probably the, 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 the point where somebody will have a protective, at least a protective effect, effect from the vaccine on clinical disease. But um, when we then went a step further to look at, do these antibody bind, uh, antibodies, do they bind to other variants of concern, for example? So we used a hematoglutination assay um, uh, to look at the ability of these antibodies to bind to multiple variants of concern. And uh, in B, it shows pre-vaccination uh, 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 binding and, then, uh, and uh, in green. And then most of the red is showing you the post-vaccination uh, binding. And what you can clearly see that we were able, to, even though um, uh, these individuals had, didn't have much of binding to the original variant, the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, as soon as they get vaccinated, they're able to bind to most of these variants, suggesting a cross uh, a reactive response is induced in individuals that have been vaccinated when they have had prior infection to SARS-CoV-2. We have also gone a step further to look at actually neutralization itself, and uh, and and it's clear uh, whether to beta variant or the delta variant or the original variant, all of them there is an increase in their capacity to neutralize um, uh, these viruses in a pseudo. Uh, 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 neutralization uh, uh, assay. So this tells us that um, uh, hybrid immunity 
uh, could be a useful strategy for future proofing against emerging variants. And so this is, is, is one way uh, uh, to encourage people to still get vaccinated, especially those that are at a higher risk, for example, those with comorbidities or people with healthcare workers, because even though we have high seroprevalence uh, or high widely uh, exposure to SARS-CoV-2, if you vaccinate individuals that have already been exposed to SARS-CoV-2, they're going to generate these cross-reactive, cross-neutralizing, and high uh, uh, levels of uh, uh, antibodies. Even more interesting is that we've then um, uh, gone on uh, recently to set up a study um, to look at these kind of responses in the lung, because we know uh, COVID-19 is a, really a disease of the lung, and severe disease really affects the lung. So um, in this uh, a slide, um, these are very early, very early uh, uh, work, uh, which I'm doing with um, um, an excellent uh, PhD student, a very talented um, Aaron Tirambo and, and, and Christine Mandarasi, who's an intern, um, very bright um, uh, 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 young lady, and, and a prof Henry Mandumba, who have worked on, on, on lung immunology for the longest time. And now we, we're working together on trying to understand the kind of responses we would see in individuals that have been vaccinated with um, uh, a COVID-19 vaccine uh, and to see whether this response could be cross-reactive against multiple variants. And in this individual, for example, this is just one individual uh, where we looked at CD4 and CD8 responses and in the blanco alveola virus samples and was vaccinated with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, two doses, the first dose was around April 2021 the second dose was around July 2021, and then he tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 in December 2021, and we recruited him uh, for bronchoscopy studies uh, around uh, uh, 23rd February 2022. So this is like half of the of of the uh, of the press. And what you can see this is just flow cytometry plots. We are looking at TNF TNF responses after stimulation with uh, positive control and CDG and C28, the Wuhan uh, wild type peptides. Um, against spike as well as alpha, beta, and delta. And what is very clear is that you can actually clearly see responses, very high responses actually against these variants of concern, even though this person uh, uh, was likely infected with Omicron because this is December and was vaccinated by the, with the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is was developed from the original variant. So be, just like I've shown you in the previous slide, the cross-reactive nature of the response, it seems like it's also cross-reactive nature of the response in the lung. And this, we think, could actually contribute to the low uh, severe disease that you see um, uh, in the individuals that have been vaccinated compared to the unvaccinated uh, individuals. So um, uh, look out for this data. Um, uh, very soon uh, uh, you'll see it in the, in, the, in the published literature. So in summary, uh, Africa has experienced a relatively mild COVID-19 pandemic today, despite having a higher uh, in hospital mortality. Africa is the least vaccinated continent to date, with vaccination coverage of less than 10%. Um, um, and that high population exposure to SARS-CoV-2 in Africa, uh, um, even in countries like Malawi, South Africa, and now it's been published, even in Kenya, uh, is now associated, it's been shown associated with low mortality of Omicron variant. Uh, despite the low COVID-19 vaccination coverage. Um, I've also talked about that COVID vaccination of individuals who have had prior history of SARS-CoV-2 infection induces a robust cross-reactive antibody immunity. That's um, uh, reactive against multiple uh, variants of concern and potentially uh, in other emerging variants that we don't know about. So um, uh, the recommendation from, from, from this uh, presentation is that uh, for policymakers is that COVID-19 vaccination policy should be tailored really to local epidemiological needs uh, uh, or situations and not just um, having an all-size-fits-all uh, approach. As now, we currently, we know, we know a, a bit more about COVID-19 than we, we had uh, before. So, why has the COVID-19 pandemic been One of the theories, or hypothesis over time, is that there's cross-reactive immunity from seasonal coronavirus. Um, we think uh, this is very unlikely, especially against variants of concern. I've showed you that we'll look at our serial surveys when we go back in time to around January 2020. We don't really see these cross reactive antibodies in our population, uh, especially in blood donors, which we think I could be a representation of the population as well. We only see it after the introduction of SARS CoV 2. So the idea of um, uh, cross reactive antibodies might not be entirely correct. Uh, and, and, and we don't think that would be uh, uh, would explain 
this relatively mild nature of the pandemic. The other one is um, uh, underreporting due to limited testing and subdotomal record keeping. Uh, yes, we think for the cases that could be the case, uh, but does not suffice to explain the muted severity of the pandemic. I, for example, if you look at the low number of severe cases, hospitalizations, and death. For us here, we can we see this in real time. Uh, when we had the original variant circulating, we, know, we knew how our hospitals uh, were affected. When we end with a beta variant, uh, clearly the beta variant, I think, gave there were lots of hospitalization, lots of severe cases and deaths. And we also saw something uh, relatively similar with Delta, but we have not seen this with Omicron. So it is, it is unlikely that it's just an issue of underreporting um, uh, uh, that's causing this um, less severe uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. What about the end of population? This is a possible hypothesis, considering First and foremost, the first paper I showed you in science, the modeling paper, suggested that actually age could be protected. And if we look at, for example, countries like Malawi, where clearly we see that we have not been hit as other countries who have a, a, a much more uh, uh, older population. Malawi, like I said, has a median age of about 17.5. This is not the only uh, uh, factor, but it's a contributing factor. We can't rule it out uh, uh, because um, even from the modeling work, from our own observations um, and well as anecdotal evidence, we can clearly see that age uh, is playing a factor because looking at the people that are actually hospitalized in the hospitals, uh, uh, you can clearly see that they're either older individuals or had other more comorbidities. So uh, thank you for paying attention. I would like to, to acknowledge a lot of people that have been involved in this work I've presented today. Uh, uh, people at the Malawi Live of Welcome, my group, the Infection and Immunity Group uh, at the Motor View, um, our collaborations at UC, collaborators at UCL, um, collaborators in South Africa at VITS, um, uh, as well as at the NICD, and so many others who have done uh, uh, an excellent work to produce this uh, this data presented today. And the funders, um, uh, I'm, I'm thankful to them for for funding this. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Andoni, for a really really fascinating. Um, sort of exploration of the lung, I guess, and the role that might be playing in protection, especially in the vaccinees. But I, I'll, there's a few questions in the, in, the, in the question box, but I'll ask a question first. Is, have you looked in the lung of people who are not vaccinated but have had COVID? I mean, do you, do you find that same type of T cell reactivity? Do, do you know that yet? Uh, thank you very much, Clive. That's uh, one of the things we're actually in the place of doing. We have not produced the data yet, but we'll have that data very, very soon. Uh, we have people lined up. Uh, actually, we have multiple combinations of people we're looking at. People that have had uh, COVID before without being vaccinated. People that have had uh, been vaccinated without having COVID. People that have been vaccinated with, uh, and then uh, had COVID. And people that had, been, um, had had COVID and then vaccinated. So it's four different groups. Uh, so we'll be able to generate that data very soon. Yeah, and I guess these are not easy studies uh, taking uh, bell from, from lungs. But uh, one of the questions in the chat box, which I think are oh, in the Q&A, is, uh, is how, many, how many have you done so far in terms of, I know you showed one representative sample, but how many, um, how many numbers do you have so far? So, so far, uh, because we started this, this, this work um, uh, close to two weeks now, we have done about four, um, and we have um, three more lined up for tomorrow. Um, and you, as you might be aware, I've been doing bronchoscopy studies for 20 years now, so we are very experienced, and um, it's yeah. much easier for us to do these complicated studies. Yeah, so this really is work in progress. Great, yes. wonderful. So a, qu a question from... Uh, Will Remigio is, is um, do you believe the microbiome type and compositions in, in persons in Africa should be investigated in relation to the way African populations respond to airway viral infections? And I'm assuming uh, this would very much mean COVID too. Yes, I, I agree that needs to be done because I know there's some work being done by Debbie Bogart's group at um, uh, University of Edinburgh uh, but they've been doing this in relation to um, uh, bacterial infections. And right. actually, clearly, you see uh, some microbiota profiles that actually are, are, are more, 
are more permissive for bacterial infections or bacterial colonization than others. So I don't see why that shouldn't be couldn't be done for for, for other virus for viruses like SARS-CoV-2. I know there's some work also being done on influence around that area. Right, right. I think you you did show um, maybe we you can just. Um, Go through it again. Um, what is the uh, vaccination coverage um, in Malawi, and 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 have you a measure of its effectiveness or its impact at all? Is is, is anyone doing those type of studies? I suppose I, I I seem to recall that the vaccination rate was very low, but maybe you could just recap that. Yeah. So the, the current vaccination coverage in Malawi is less than five percent of the eligible population. At the moment, mm -hmm. and yes, we are actually in the moment uh, right now recruiting on a vaccine effectiveness study which are, we are leading here in Malawi, um, and based at the, uh, the Malawi Liver Program, which um, uh, I'm the local PI for that study. And we're actually, for us specifically, looking at vaccine effectiveness in the individuals with comorbidities, looking at individuals with HIV, diabetes, and hypertension, considering that uh, those are the, the groups that are most affected by uh, severe COVID. So we are actually at the moment in the process of, we are in the process of recruiting. So, so, so this one's a, a, a nice question. Uh, and I, it's a question that touches on what I was going to maybe address is, is uh, and this is from uh, Michelle Latarque. Thank you for an enlightening talk. However, it looks like we still cannot explain the differences in disease incidence and severity in the world. Asia and Africa are similar in their infection rates and severity. Has anyone looked at the similarities between these two continents to try and explain? I guess that's not necessarily your data, but it could be interesting to have that discussion. Yeah, um, it'll be interesting, but it's... It... There's always always an issue of um, uh, when you now look at the, the influence of vaccination that comes into play. So if you look at most Asian countries, like I said, if you look at the map of vaccination coverage in the world, it's really Africa is very different from the rest of the continent. So even in Asia, they have way better vaccination coverage than Africa. So yes, they have diff similar uh, in terms of um, the, 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 the epidemiology, uh, but in terms of vaccination coverage, which has an influence, is very different. So really comparing Africa with other continents um, would be a very, very difficult study in terms because of that. I guess, I guess as well, uh, my question would be, living in, here in South Africa, yeah. where, where our pandemic is, or people have been hit far harder than in Malawi and maybe other countries to the north of us, uh, what makes us different in South Africa from Malawi? You have me, a younger... <laughs> yes, you, you, you got your answer. To me, that's one of the contributing factors. Malawi is 17.5 median age. Yeah, yeah. So way higher population. South Africa is way higher than that. It's actually so that, in Malawi and the UK. Yes, yes. I, I guess that, that's another question in the, in the, in the box is, um, has any regression model showed the contribution of ages of age to the rates in relation to other factors. I'm not yes. aware, of it, but, but yes, please tell us. Yes, it's been done. That's why I gave you a, a good example of this is actually the, the, the first study I showed that's published mm. in science. So that took into account multiple factors to see what would be the, the what would contribute to, to severity of COVID-19. And age was one of the strongest factors to determine that as well as the, the resources that are available in a particular country in terms of critical care medicine. So what, what, what is the immunology behind age? I mean, is, 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 uh, is it a, a receptor virus interaction that's just not as strong or can you speculate? What does age, what does age do? Uh, to be honest, at this stage, I, I, I'm not sure. Do yeah, I think it's, it's something yeah. interesting to look at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, other questions? As a, another question is, do you think Africa can handle the coming waves, the next wave? Um, as you said, there's a very high zero prevalence in the population. So the relationship, I guess that's a question about the relationship between immunity and, and um, severity. 
we can only uh, speculate based on what we have had so far. So we've had four waves. Um, if you ask me, can Africa handle the next wave? The answer would be yes, because we've had four waves so far. Yeah, uh, unless the next wave is going to be worse. Uh, but we thought Omicron was going to be worse. And we know what Omicron uh, wave has been like in terms of severe disease. Very highly transmissible, but in terms of severe disease has been relatively mild. So my answer would be yes. Right. So and, and, and another question is, is, is you're taking bowel samples. Is this from, I guess, I guess the Omicron is, is more, has a higher affinity for the upper respiratory tract as opposed to the delta and the beta before, which infects more of the lower respiratory tract. Is, is this, um, are you able to, to get samples? I mean, is bowel from the lower? It's not the upper, right? But are you able to, to identify whether there may be immunity in that upper respiratory tract? Yeah, so, del so, so the BAL is from the lower respiratory tract, but we have been doing studies and we have the samples now. We, uh, one of the papers I showed, we published, um, uh, where we are looking at the profile of immunological responses in the upper respiratory tract. So we can sample the nose using what we call nose scripts. So we can get um, uh, all kinds of cells, T cells, neutrophils, monocytes from the, lung, from, from the upper respiratory tract. And uh, we have data to show actually, uh, even in from autopsy studies we have done, uh, to show that if you look at the immunological profile in the nose, mirrors really very well with what you are seeing in the lower respiratory tract. So we should be able to, to do that looking across waves because we have samples for the for, for, for all the four waves. Right. That, 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 that will be a fantastic set of data to look at. So, so I guess following on from that is about tissue resident memory cells and whether you've, um, I guess, got, can take bio, tissue biopsies and look at can you do that? Or, or what is your comment about tissue resident cells? As, as another question. Interesting and very important question. Uh, uh, actually, if this talk was delayed by a month, uh, I could have presented that data because as part of the, 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 the work we're doing, we have uh, markers for tissue residency in the Blanc Um um And I can tell you right now that the response is both from tissue resident uh, CD8 T cells as well mm -hmm. as uh, uh, the, uh, the non-resident CD8 T cells, even in the, at the lung level, uh, from what we can see so far. We can't really take uh, lung biopsies from these individuals, but we have samples from autopsy in, uh, uh, studies with lung samples and other tissue, which are stored in, 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 uh, in liquid nitrogen for feathers. We can uh, clear a look at that as well. Once we, we, we were able to to get a clear picture from these healthy individuals uh, using a bronchoalveolar part. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, sort of going back a bit to yeah. sort of the more epic kind of question is, um, do you have excess mortality statistics for uh, for the pandemic in Malawi? Uh, this would be good to cross-check with the low mortality statistics you have, so excess mortality. Yeah, so right now we don't have clear excess mortality data. Um, but what I can tell you, which is uh, uh, could be important, is if we look at, uh, for example, one, you can look at an anecdotal evidence um, uh, from experience of clinicians um, and the hospitals. Uh, we can also look for, um, uh, which is the data that we'll, we'll have very soon, looking at oxygen consumption. So we know, for example, in Malawi, uh, the beta variant, the, the, the delta variant, which were the ones that were relatively severe in Malawi, had lots of high, as high uh, oxygen consumption because a lot more people were, up, uh, were in the hospital severe disease compared to the Omicron. So we can have some um, uh, predictions using those kind of models uh, uh, because we don't have very good uh, excess mortality. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, a question from India. Um, do you believe that herbs and spices has a whoops, I'm coming thick and fast now. Just go back. Has a positive effect on the patient's health? Um, as in India, whole population has shifted to. I'm not sure I can pronounce this correctly. Are you reader uh, to improve immunity? Is is that something that is being looked at in Malawi? Um, I'm not aware of um, uh, of any herbal. 
medicines to improve uh, immunity against COVID-19 that we are doing in Malawi. So uh, I don't have much, much to comment on that. Right. And, and here is a, a, maybe a philosophical question in some ways, but um, has a low vaccination rate perhaps have been a blessing in disguise? Uh, first, second and uh, waves were hard hitting, but not the third and fourth waves. Did this exposure pre-vaccination induce a stronger natural immunity? So it's not really that philosophical, it's really practical and, and immunological. Yeah. Do you think actually, that's, that's actually, timing? Actually, yeah, actually, we think uh, probably that's what has happened. Um, yeah. Is that after the three waves, uh, the population has been primed enough that there is some degree of, um, uh, of population level immunity that has been developed that has clearly made Omicron to be at least uh, mild in this population. Because we know, if you look at the vaccination data, for example, from the West, um, uh, the Omicron wave, the mildness of Omicron wave is being attributed to vaccination. Yeah. In places like where we are, coming where we are in Africa, uh, it's clearly when we look at the self reverence data, there's very high exposure. So clearly that could also be a contributing factor to this Omicron wave being mild at the moment. I mean, there is some data showing that, uh, I'm thinking of Alessandra City's group, showing that um, there is cross reactivity between the other alpha beta coronaviruses and uh, certainly the the beta and the delta. I'm not sure that maybe the Omicron too. I, I mean, you 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 may you, you did mention that as a maybe and discounted it, but I'm not sure. Do you know? Have you measured that at all, or looked at that, or considered to look at that? So we looked at that at the, at the antibody level. So I did, we didn't look at this at the right. T cell right. at the T cell level. At the T cell level, it's possible. But uh, for sure, at the, at the antibody level, and we know that most of the work um, uh, is been pointing uh, neutralizing antibodies as uh, a big, a big um, uh, um, surrogate against uh, uh, disease. We know uh, uh, T cells play a role. Um, we don't discount that. I'm a T cell immunologist myself, uh, but I've not, we have not looked at that from that angle. Yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering whether um, looking at antibody responses is. Is, is, is obviously very practical because they're easy to measure, but may be misleading us a little bit, or maybe they're not, I don't know, but but uh, certainly towards vac vaccine responses. I don't know, what, do you, as, a, as a fellow T cell immunologist, what are your comments about that? Yeah, I think it's, it's to me, I think it would be interesting. And actually it's easy. All we have to do is um, uh, uh, get the right uh, peptides um, and then we can actually look it at this from a lung level, not just a, a blood level, because that, the disease is supposed to be a, a, a lung disease. So you can clearly include this in the panel and just see what's what, if it's that yeah. level. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So another question, um, do you think the comorbidities present in Africa, which do affect disease severity, differ from those in Europe and the US, America, or the America session? The data seems to be very, very, very similar in terms of the key comorbidities that are associated with severe COVID, diabetes, hypertension, and HIV in some cases are the same ones that are, are also attributed with severe COVID in, in the West. Um, it's possible that there are other uh, phenotypes within those groups that could be different, but the overall picture seems to be the same. Okay, and a question on COVID, do you have the prevalence of long COVID in your data, or, or in Malawi, I guess, in general, and immunological characteristics of those with long COVID. So we, 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 we don't we don't we don't have that um, uh, currently, um, but it's, it would be something interesting. We have some uh, longitudinal data from people that have recovered from severe COVID. Uh, we, we look at uh, at the time they are hospitalized, and then six months later. We can always go back uh, uh, to see if we have some in those groups that have long COVID and what will be the immunological profile. But at the moment, it's not our area of focus. Right, right. And, and, and a, a, a very much of a lab question in terms of the practicalities of taking bowel during a pandemic. Uh, would you be processing and handling these samples in a BSL-3 or Category 3 lab? 
or have you ensured that participants are definitely COVID negative before sampling? I guess that's a very much a safe health and safety question. Yeah, thank you, Ruby, for that question. Um, uh, yeah, so so what we normally do is um, these individuals are all screened, pre-screened. So on a day like today, for the samples tomorrow, they are screened for SARS-CoV-2 by PCR. So only when you're negative, then you're recruited into the study. Right. So, so the, the, we do this not in the PSA or three because they are all negative, and they are all healthy individuals. Right. So when you when you kind of take the the COVID or people who've had COVID, okay, you obviously need to wait till they're negative, and then yes. take, yeah, okay. I I guess you can't take it during. Yeah. Um, is there a possible role of other viruses in their apparent uniqueness in Africa? I I, I presume that means other than other coronaviruses but other cross-reactive maybe t-cell immunity antibodies from it, other it viruses. Could be not only other coronaviruses it could be other viruses in general uh, mm. um, um, i'm not aware of work being done this side of the world on this uh, but at least i know that we have done some other work before looking at prevalence of uh, co-infection of viruses in, uh, in these populations and Clear, there's a lot of there's very high co-infections with multiple viruses, but whether that is contributing to the mildness of uh, severe COVID or COVID nineteen, uh, I'm not I'm not very sure. Right, right. Um, th there's one comment uh, which I'm not quite sure what what this might mean, but immunosenescence question mark um, whether that's after natural disease or after vaccination or both. But um, maybe you can extra. We can extrapolate what that might mean. Immunosenescence question mark. Is, is are you looking at sort of immunosenescence markers, or whether um, patients undergo some kind of energy or inability to respond, or accelerated maturation due to terminal differentiation? If we're looking at T cells or B cells. No, no, not at the moment. We are, we are, we are not looking at that. Maybe the, the will can give us some, shed some light on that in the in the question box again. What it might mean. Um, I'm just um, looking at the questions I've missed. Um, the question is: Is the beta variant more severe than the delta? Question three question marks. <laughs> That's a very good question, and um, right now I think for us the jury is still on is still on it because we, from experience, yeah, and how that affected Malawi as a country, the beta variant was um, uh, hit Malawi more than the Delta variant, but that's just anecdotal evidence. When we look at uh, data from the hospital and we put all different factors, or fact. Uh, 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 um, possible uh, confounding factors, it does seem like from our hospital data, from one hospital, that the Delta variant was more severe, had higher mortality than the Beta variant. But we're still working uh, uh, on that data to try to make sense. Uh, but in reality, all I can tell you is that the Beta and the Delta were worse than the original variant and Omicron. That we can do for sure. Yeah. And, um, one other question is, uh, uh, I'll just read it. Which, which scenario or impact could you predict if Omicron variant of concern will be the first, will be the first before Delta variant of concern infection? Um, I guess that, that may be a hypothetical question, I suppose. Yeah, it's a very hypothetical question. So my answer will have to be hypothetical. So I choose to pass. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, um, a question on host genetics. Is there a predominant, or do we know if there's any protective HLA associations, especially in the class one, of course, uh, alleles in Malawi? Do, 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 do you know if anyone's doing that, or do we have any data? We haven't done that, and we are not, as far as I know, we are not doing that. Um, but it's, it's an interesting thought, considering that this has been done with HIV. Uh, uh, Maybe we should start looking for that as well for um, SARS-CoV-2. It's an interesting 
Because mm. we certainly know that for each other, to some degree, they're yeah. on TV. Um, there's the high density of infections in general, not just other coronaviruses, contribute to perhaps what would be heightened immune responses at baseline. So that's another cross-reactive potentially question. I can give you some 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 insights on that on some work we have, we did in the past. So yeah. we once did a study where we a PhD student um, uh, co supervised by Prof Mandumba, uh, and who did some work with me as well, where they looked at um, innate immunity, focusing on in, on on monocytes, and actually comparing um, uh, Malawians and 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 uh, UK uh, adults and. Um, what was clear from that is that if you just look at the monocyte profile, um, the, 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 the proportions of intermediates and, and non-classical monocytes was actually way higher in the Malawi population than in the UK population. And we know innate immunity is it's very important uh, for protection against viruses as well. So there is some, some degree of uh, differences that you could see from an African population point of view because of in, in onslaught of multiple uh, inf uh, infections uh, agents um, uh, over time that actually seem to, to change the nature of the next immune response. Uh, and that could be uh, one of the reasons that you see differences. But that still needs to be done in a proper way, uh, specifically for SARS-CoV-2. But we know that there are differences uh, uh, because of the environment. Um, another comment. Hmm? Uh, and a pushback on traditional medicines. Uh, can we rule out traditional medicines in Africa completely? Uh, I mean, that's one thing that's common between Africa and Asia. In South Africa, a considerable number of people practice traditional medicine, particularly in rural areas. So, so, so comments. I, I, like I said last time, it's difficult for me to comment on traditional medicine because I have not done any work. I know our colleagues at the Camus University of of, uh, of Health Sciences, which is just a stone throw away from where, where I am. Um, there's a whole department of herbal medicine. Uh, uh, they, they, they're doing some herbal medicine work, but I'm not sure it's directed against SARS-CoV-2. So I don't have much information on it. But yes, there's people use herbal medicine here a lot as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, another, maybe we have three minutes. I've been told to cut off unceremoniously. Uh, exactly at the top of the hour, so I'll try and keep to time. Does the infection from SARS-CoV-2 induce a strong bronchial-associated lymphoid tissue response compared with other viruses? Do you have evidence for that? We don't have evidence for it, uh, but it's one of those where we have to recruit those individuals that have recovered from SARS-CoV-2, not just the ones that have been vaccinated, and to look at the, 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 the frequency of these antigen-specific cells in the lung. Because we have an idea from other work we have done with flu, for example, of what to expect in terms of uh, uh, the, num the frequency of uh, antigen-specific T cells in the lung. So what we don't have right now is from people that have not been vaccinated, but they have recovered from SARS-CoV-2, and mm -hmm. then we can do that comparison. That's doable. Right. Right. Um, I, I guess um, here in South Africa, we, our, our, our questions around heterologous prime boosting and mix and matching, uh, uh, I think we're just a little bit ahead of you in terms of the numbers vaccinated, but is, is, this, a, is this a discussion or um, an avenue that you're going to be looking at in terms of uh, mix and matching AstraZeneca with Pfizer, for example, that type of thing? Actually, uh, Malawi recently has, has put into policy the mix and match. So all booster doses in Malawi are to do with the mRNA vaccine. So if you have had AstraZeneca vaccine, the booster dose is going to be mRNA uh, a vaccine. So it's so that gives an opportunity to actually looking at uh, uh, individuals who have mixed and match in terms of immune responses as well. But that, that policy just came into play, I think, about two weeks ago. Right. Great. Okay, we're almost at the top of the hour. And it just, I have to say thank you very much, Kondwani. This has been a very stimulating talk. And judging by the numbers of questions, a very, very vigorous question and answer session. So thank you all very much for joining us. Uh,
uh, today. And next month, uh, there'll be another IUIS webinar at the last Monday of the month. So thank you all very much indeed. And good day and have a safe March, 1st of March tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Clive. Thank you, everybody.